Welcome, everyone, to another episode of 41 is the Mic. I am Matt Derrick from Chiefs Digest. And alongside me, as always, is backup quarterback enthusiast Nick Jacobs from KSHB 41. Nick, how are you doing this bright and glorious day? I'm good, yes, and you're right. I love I love a good quarter uh, backup quarterback this time of year, you know? <laughs> they give you a lot of hope. There's a lot of belief and with uh, Carson Wentz, I think the Chiefs are getting themselves an Alex Smith uh, level backup potentially. It's it does ring some familiar tones. A a West Coast quarterback for for the Chiefs. It's got some experience, and we'll kind of dig into that and the other moves this week because the Chiefs obviously brought back a couple of their own. Um, so we'll talk about that today. We also had the uh, uh, an interesting results from the stadium election for the Chiefs and the Royals that we'll discuss and kind of what we think uh, went there and what happens next and uh, touch on some other things going around Chiefs Kingdom. But right now we're in the middle of draft prep, Nick. Mm-hmm. And we've gone through wide receivers. We've gone through tackles. It's a couple of big needs for the Chiefs. Um, next week, I think we're going to go over the, the edges and the, the pass rushers. This week, though, you know, we're looking at defensive tackles, and it's a it's a different position group and a need than what we maybe thought a few weeks ago, because the Chiefs went into the off season with two defensive tackles under contract. They had Matt Dickerson and Neil Farrell. <laughs> So it was a position of probably serious need about a month ago. But since then, they've brought everybody back. Mm -hmm. Um, Literally, the only player that took a snap at defensive tackle for the Chiefs last year that is not back is Keandre Coburn. So (laughs) it was another club. Um, So they brought back the game. But that doesn't mean that defensive tackle is still not a need in the draft for this team. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, like you, I would still... I would still be mindful of if there's a one tech available for long term that they potentially could want that could compete with Farrell. And then also um, <clears throat> if there's a three tech that you can have that potentially can be the heir apparent to Chris Jones long term. If if either one of those opportunities presents itself, then those are things that uh, for the Chiefs, I think they really do need to kind of potentially invest in. If you're investing in a, a potential Air parent three tech. I think that's like a day a day two type of move. If you're investing in a one tech, I I still think that that I think that that can all go almost to day either day two or day three. I'm not saying you get both of them, but if one of them becomes available, you just want to continue to steadily add on um, to the plan overall. And you know, finding three techs is tougher than finding one text in a given year. Yeah, and. I mean, because truly, I mean, you're talking about true noses or one text. I mean, Mike Pinnell is really the only guy that the Chiefs have um, at that position. And I mean, Mike's up there. I mean, he's the guy that I think you certainly wanted to manage his snaps. And honestly, the way he played at the end of the season this year, I'm almost, if I'm Brad Veach and Andy Reid, I almost feel like, hey, Mike, we've signed you. Um, Go home, hang out until October. We'll call you. You know, you come in after the trade deadline and then we'll get you to, we'll we'll, we'll get you to work. Um, But that's, and and I don't don't want to overlook a guy like Isaiah Bugs because I know a lot of uh, fans are really excited about his potential too. But, you know, I mean, that potential. Potential is is the key word there. I mean, it hasn't been realized yet, and and I wouldn't even tr- I wouldn't put him as size wise into that kind of true nose category either. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, you like what he brings to the table. You like the experience that he has. But as I've said time and time again on this podcast, you can't bank on what can be. You can only go with what you know 100 percent is. So I know that sounds weird to say, but you always. When you have a chance to build your roster, especially this time of the year, you always continue to build and add on at spots, no matter how you feel, whether you're good at that or not, because that can turn in two to three injuries pretty quickly. And strengths can turn into weaknesses. I remember one year the Chiefs had just an awesome running back room that included uh, Jamal Charles, Charkandrick West, Spencer Ware, and I can't remember if there's a fourth running back, and then Jamal tore his ACL in week six, and I remember at various points, um, Spencer either had a hamstring or Trey Kendrick West had um, injuries. And and then so then, you know, they almost had nothing at running back one year. And that that can turn in the blink of an eye. So, like, I'm just saying, like, you can't 
say, well, we got we got this guy's this, this guy's this, this guy's that. We're good to go. Injuries change it in 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 a in a moment's notice. So like it, you gotta stack every position as best as you can. Doesn't mean you can get the best player at every spot, you know, backing up the best player, backing up the best player, but like you gotta continually add to where you can weather storms if you need to at the two at, at two and three at each position group. Yeah, and uh, depth is obviously the, the key to a couple of these different spots on the on the defensive line. Uh, looking at this class, Nick, um, it's certainly there's some big names at the top of the draft. Mm. I think we'll probably find out just you know how deep this draft goes. But how does it look? You know, uh, there's some big names maybe in the first round, but is there anybody in that group that you think would be in the Chiefs' landing spot potential? Um, I, I'll. I'll tell you right now, there, there isn't a, there's only one defensive tackle. If I'm in the Chiefs position, that if they're there in the first round, you take instantly. Um, but other than that, not really. <laughs> like, and that's and that's not a, that's not ideal compared to other years where there was quality defensive tackles. You could take three or four in, in the first round. I mean, obviously, I'll just mention them now. It's going to be Byron Murphy from Texas. Like that guy could play a one. He could play a three. He's athletic enough. I mean. He he's got the lateral quickness, the strength, and ability to drop the knee on double teams. And we talked about previously how many times I'd watched Don Terry Poe have to work on understanding how to drop the knee based on how the double team he was taking on. Murphy's already there. He already knows that part. So like a defensive line coach doesn't have to invest the time in that. And when you think about guys taking hundreds and hundreds of snaps to learn that. The fact he doesn't learn that means that they got something else they can focus on, whether it's maybe counters in their pass rushing move. Maybe there's something with their get off that they they want to do a little bit differently in the NFL or pad level wise or something. That not having to worry about that is what makes that so so big for Murphy and what's so appealing already. I mean, look, he can take on a double team and hold the line. He's got a good spin move. He's got good acceleration to be able to be a crafty pass rusher. And I, I thought he brought a lot of energy and a good physical presence on every single play. So for me, Murphy, just he, he was the guy that I don't think he's going to be there when the Chiefs pick at 32. But if he is, that's the one guy I, I don't know if I, could, I, if I could pass up with how versatile he could be in Steve Spagnuolo's scheme. Yeah, you know, and, and looking around, I mean, there's, uh, and like the list I'm looking at right now, that only has two defensive tackles that would be kind of first round category. And, yeah. uh, and this list, like Johnny Newton from Illinois is, you know, maybe borderline could go into the second. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, Braden Fisk is probably a name, but, um, don't know how you feel about those two guys. Um, so I, I'll mention this guy because I know a question will come up about him. Uh, uh, Jerzon Newton from Illinois. Um, what I wrote down about him, like he's a popular name, that's probably going to go in the first round. Most people expect him to, and like I just, I just want to put this in there so people can understand it. Um, like I mean, he has the size, yeah, he, he has some of the athletic ability, and everything. But like the number one thing I wrote down in my notes is he's like he's like a vehicle that has a stick shift, and it's stuck in gear, and it can't. It can't, you know, the, the stick shift won't go to another gear. So, like, there's a top end speed he can get to. And it just reminds me so much of Eric Hicks when I was watching him. Because, like, Eric Hicks had the same problem to where, like, he could get to a certain level. And then that was the level he was that, that he was at. He couldn't find an additional closing speed or that next gear. And Newton's the same way to where, like, when I'm watching him rush and try to chase down a quarterback or running back or whatever. I'm like, oh, that poor guy's stuck in second gear and he can't get to third, man. There's there's no stick shift. You know, like an engine's revving at that same spot, and you're like, I gotta I gotta stick shift before that engine blows up. And like it uh that this is I had to I had to say that because that was what I put down there and I, I saw it way too many reps and I'm just like, man, I was like, that's that's just unfortunate who that guy is. So um but the other guys you were mentioning, yeah, it was sweat. Uh, I'll I'm just going in order. Sweat from Texas. I mean, he could be a one tech, but he's he's just a really big guy, and I think he tires out too quickly. He's and, huge, <laughs> yeah, and like he he just doesn't have the lateral quickness for the twists and stunts and things that the Chiefs would do. Um, the guy, the next guy on my list, and this is I think he's going second round, 
is Chris Jenkins Jr. I think it's Jr. I know it's Chris Jenkins. Um, his dad played for the Panthers, and with Chris, I mean, he's a strong tackle. He can bench press guards and lock them out, then shuck the linemen to make the tackle. Um, he's at his best when he's allowed to tag up field. He didn't always get to do that at Michigan, so like a chief scheme would be really, really good for him. He's the guy that I would take in, in a day two if I'm the Chiefs. If he's on the board there, I think he could be a really promising three-tech. I, I loved his closing speed, loved his spin move. It was really quick. Um, and then I he the lateral quickness was there to where I think the Chiefs could have a lot of fun with him. There's stuff he's got to develop, um, but in terms of what he can be like, he could be a good long-term three tech in my book to really kind of learn from Chris Jones. And I know you mentioned Brendan Fisk from Florida state, if I remember correctly. Yep. Um, yeah. Fisk is another guy I like. I thought he was an aggressive pass rusher. He's got a strong initial pop on offensive lineman with, when he has the right leverage, which he typically does, but he had a solid bull rush um, that allowed him to be competitive. And he has a violent rip move and he plays with that level of intensity that Joe Cullen really likes along that offensive line. And I felt like he treated every snap as it was the most important. There's some guys that'll take some plays off, some guys that'll take some breaks, they'll get tired and everything. Fisk is like, no, nah, I'm out here on the field, I'm going to give what I got. And so, like, that's 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 a good trait to be able to have in the multiple games that I watched with him. Um, I thought he was a solid run defender, and I thought he was, he, I thought initially he could be a good rotational pass rusher. While you continue to develop him overall as a player, where he's going to have problems, and this is where I think kind of would he would struggle as a one tech is taking on he he struggled to take on double teams, and so he's going to have to get stronger at that if they were wanting to put him there. But I think he could easily be a rotational three tech. And was there another another individual you named off? You, you hit the ones that I did, and okay. and and getting down the the sweat was was going to be an interesting one for me. Mm-hmm. Um, reminds, I mean, physically, just reminds me a lot of Keandre Coburn. I mean, also coming from Texas too. I mean, it just seems like um, very similar player, and also in the sense that whomever he get that gets him is probably going to have the same issues with Keandre. It's just you know as far as getting the weight down to a manageable level that he can play with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't disagree with you one bit on that, Matt. Uh, is there anybody, you know, in that kind of, I mean, cause I, I, I mean, last year Coburn was a day three pick and that would probably seem to be the most likely area where the chiefs are maybe looking at tackle this year would be on day three. Mm-hmm. Anybody in that group on day two that would really interest you and in maybe the second or third round where you'd say, Hey, this would be a good fit. Um, I think we're starting like for me mentally, um, Chris Jenkins is kind of that second round level. So now where I'm thinking this is kind of third round, fourth round area. And this guy, I mean, like when I watched him, I uh, I, I thought he looked a lot like Mike Dana. I was like, he's like where Mike Dana is right now. So like where Mike Dana was coming out of college took some time to get to where he's at. This guy, I think, is already kind of where Mike Dana is at right now. So I don't know if you necessarily need him, but if you have two – players the caliber of of Mike Dana out there at this point that's actually not a bad thing and that's that's Michael Hall Jr from Ohio State um now the reason I say that is because Hall Hall would have to play three tech or kind of rotate into like a five tech spot just like just like Danny can he's got to get a little bit stronger but he he has good upper body strength but I think he can I think he can tap into it even more with a good weight training coach I thought he had a solid bull rush has really good acceleration and the necessary lateral quickness to be able to shoot the gaps and loop around. Um, Double teams is where he kind of had the problem, but that's to be expected for his size. And he can, he can take on one block and be able to maintain or rip through it or do whatever he needs to. But I just, I, if the chiefs weren't going to re-sign Mike Dana, like I would have been like Michael Hall jr. Is the guy that they got to go get to kind of replace that role. So it'd just be a matter if they want another guy like that or not. And I think like he could kind of potentially be that guy, whether it be the third, fourth round range. Um, Fabian Lovett, senior from Florida State. I know that's somebody I think the Chiefs are uh, have been paying attention to. Uh, I thought I thought he provides a strong one tech that has enough athletic ability within ten yards to kind of cause some problems. Um, he can he can lock out and disengage from defenders, which that's a very underrated trait that I don't know if enough people kind of realize like. 
that is something, especially at a one tech spot. If you can do that, like that keeps the defender from your chest and keeps them at bay and everything. And he he's able to read the, he's able to read the backfield and adjust accordingly to it, which is kind of part of what the lock off part of it is. Um, I thought he had a solid bull rush. Didn't have elite strength to it to really kind of overwhelmingly walk somebody back quickly. I liked his rip move. I liked his lateral quickness. Um, and then I just think with him, he needs somebody like Joe Cullen to really tap in to what he can be as a player. I don't think he had the right or defensive line coach at Florida State to really kind of hone in on that. And above all else, um, the Florida State had him maintain the line of scrimmage for the most part. That was kind of the goal of what they wanted him to do. So I take that when I see a player who I know has a good, a high motor, as they would call it, um, or you know, a high intensity hustle, you know, an energy giver, as uh, some Chiefs coaches would call it, um, I, and I see them kind of not have it. I I look at how they how, what their body language is in between plays to see if it's them tired or if it's what they're supposed to do in the scheme. And then I also kind of look at what the other defensive linemen are doing, if it's a contained thing or how they're, how they're approaching it and how athletic the quarterback is and that type of stuff. So with him, it was more of what I think they were asking him to do versus anything else. So, um, but thing for love, it is he can take on the double team. He can take on the double team. He can maintain, he can hold the line and he dropped the knee when necessary. So I know that sounds like a fun thing from Game of Thrones, but I'm telling you, for defensive tackles, the ability to drop the knee is a big, big thing and being able to create a pile and being able to not get moved back, especially if you are. It's the equivalent of an offensive lineman having a proper anchor. It's just on the defensive side, you're not letting the double team go any further than where it did right there, and you're ruining their double team plan to get to your teammate, the linebacker. So when you drop that knee, you were saying, not today. And then, so that's, that's, that's the key on that part. Uh, I got a couple other guys, but Matt, you got any thoughts or anything that you want to put out there while I get a drink of water? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're definitely right. And, you know, and that's one thing that you, you kind of alluded to this a little bit, and especially it made me think about it when talking about Michigan, uh, because obviously that's where Mike Dana came from too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and he, he moved around a lot there, which really led to him coming to Kansas city and doing the same thing. And that, to me, wouldn't be a surprise, especially with the Chiefs having already brought back so much of their defensive tackle group from last year, even though you and I both agree that they could really use a a true zero or a one tech type of body, that still their preference is to have guys with a lot of flexibility. I mean, it, you know, from a tackle position standpoint, they're really looking at those guys as first and second down players, because on third down, they're going to be putting a bunch of edges out there. And so we may be talking, when we talk about edges next week, we might be talking about those guys with inside, outside flexibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, this group, I mean, you're not really doing talking about that with tackles. Tackles are tackles. <laughs> so you're not really looking at the, I mean, they're, they're, let's put it this way. There's no Chris Jones in this group that's no. a defensive tackle where you'd say, okay, he could line up on the outside and you'd be okay. No, yeah. And I mean, when Chris is coming out, I mean, like he he ran hot and cold. Like you could see the dominance of him. And the way that he could shoot up, shoot up field, and how quickly he could get up field, um, his hand fighting and the quickness of his hand fighting got so much better in the NFL. Like it wasn't at that level coming out of college. Like I mean, he had it. He he could do, he could do the forklift. You know, where he raises the guy's defender up and either rips through it or does what he needs to. He could do some of those things. He had the pieces of it, but being able to collectively put it together and be able to put it together at a lightning quick speed, like that took some time for him, but he got to that point. So, you know, but the the knock on him coming out was how hot or cold he ran, how he'd take plays off, but then you would see the pure dominance, and that's what kept him out of the first round. It's just just how people questioned how much of intensity he was going to be able to show in the league. And, I mean, he went out there, you know, and, and the Chiefs were able to get him there in the second round, and, like, he, he was able to kind of turn into the top-paid defensive tackle in the NFL. It took a little bit to get there, but he's there now. Yeah, that still absolutely just makes me laugh every time I think about it. That, you know, that was the concern about Chris Jones was that he takes too many plays off and doesn't always give us a hundred percent. And 
I mean, could you think of a, a, I mean, a player that has been more of the complete opposite in their NFL career than, than their, maybe their their draft prospects? Because I, I mean, that that guy has just had a motor that's not stopped since he got to Kansas City. For the most part, yes, there are some times where the the college version of him does come out from time to time. But what do you? Here's what I'm saying. We're gonna veer off course here a little bit. What do you remember from that draft? Uh, from that. The night before and then that night as well. What was what was the big story line going on at that time? Well first round. First round, my recollection and this is 2016, if I'm I know, right. and I'm starting I'm starting to get 2015 conflated there. I'm trying to remember. I I remember that the 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 talk the night the night let's see, no, I'm I, I, I No, you're on the right path because the Chiefs end up trading out of the first round to take Chris. Yeah, no, I'm I'm like, well, I'm getting I'm getting old, Nick. So I'm. <laughs> see, you want me to, I wasn't. You want me? That was the first draft that I was the last draft that I wasn't on the beat for. So I okay. just remember th- hearing about it and everything, and I, I remember, you know, the big talk then being I think Miles Jack, and um, yeah, being so, available. So the Broncos traded ahead of the Chiefs to take Paxton Lynch, the quarterback from Memphis, yes. and. Then, as soon as that happened, the Chiefs traded back and traded out of the first round. Um, and then Dorsey came down that night to talk to everybody in the in the presser room, and he was talking about how, you know, they traded back. I remember Teicher asked him something, and Dorsey kind of very quick in his response, and I remember Hervey asked something. And Dorsey very quick in his response when it related to Paxton Lynch both times, if I remember correctly. And then I remember TJ asking um, <clears throat> about if there was somebody still on the board that he surprised was still there. And then he mentioned Miles Jack at that point. And then a lot of us are kind of wondering, why are you mentioning Miles Jack? Because you're, you know, you're coming up and early in the second round, he may still be on the board and you just kind of gave that away. So was that, you know, somebody else that they wanted and he wanted them to think that? Or was it somebody he wanted, but because of the medical that Miles Jack had that it wasn't going to be something that, you know, maybe team doctors were going to give the thumbs up on for the Chiefs. But either way, there was that aspect to it. And then the Chiefs ended up with Chris Jones. Yeah. And um, I think the the other really incredible thing about that is that, and because I think Chris has talked about before that um, Arizona Cardinals were really interested in him and mm. they were probably going to take him certainly in the second round. But um, Chris was told by the Jaguars on, I guess that I'm, I'm trying to remember if they had moved it to Thursday, Friday. I think they had at that point moved it to Thursday, Friday, Saturday on those draft nights. Yeah. Well, yeah. First, yeah. First round was on its own night at that point. The Jaguars told Chris Friday before the second round started, we're taking you at 35. I mean, you're, you're going to be a Jaguar. So we you know, welcome, welcome to Jacksonville. And he was absolutely stunned when they took miles Jack. Because he had literally been told that he was going to the Jaguars by the Jaguars. Yeah. So yeah, I I think that um, I think there was some gamesmanship there by John Dorsey. <laughs> yeah. So for people that don't know, um, Paxton Lynch went twenty six to the Broncos. Twenty seven was Kenny Clark to the Packers. Twenty eight, I believe, is where the Chiefs were and traded out of. Uh, the Forty ers took Joshua. Joshua Garnett, a guard from Stanford. Then if you go down a handful of picks, top of the second round, Emmanuel Ogba from the Browns. Uh, Jalen Smith, the Broncos took a linebacker, even though he had the ACL issue. Then, yeah, like you said, pick 36, the Jaguars took Miles Jack. And the very next pick, 37, the Chiefs took Chris Jones. And then after Chris Jones, Dolphins took Xavier Howard. So that was uh, that's quite a uh, quite a little trio right there in terms of what they did and i and if i'm not mistaken i think even the jaguars traded up in front of the chiefs to get yeah that yeah I so they did so i mean yeah i mean that and i saw so i said i said they were going to take him there i forgot about the trade and everything so now i mean uh, jacksonville would have been i think back at 42 mm-hmm. so that's where they would have taken chris i mean and so when uh, chris saw the trade he thought they were trading up to get him so when he heard Miles Jack name, that was a stutter. So Chiefs, I mean, obviously that worked out very well for the Chiefs. And 
Miles Jack was a decent player for a little while with Jacksonville, but nothing like Chris Jones. Right. Yeah. And so that twenty <clears throat> so the twenty sixteen draft is Chris Jones, uh Kabari Russell, Parker Anger, Eric Murray, um <clears throat> Demarcus Robinson, Kevin Hogan, Tyree Kill, DJ White, and Daddy Nicholas. So that was that was the <clears throat> and so because Paxton Lynch got taken by the Broncos, the very next year Patrick Mahomes became a Kansas City Chief. And just looking at this briefly here, now you're taking me down memory road. Yeah. Uh, Nick, um, I think <laughs> I think I see four players taken in the second round who have been Kansas City Chiefs. And so, uh you're talking about the 2016 draft and the 2016 draft. Okay. Yes. You, you want to? You, you just tell me the names for the viewers so that they don't have to wait too long. We we got Reggie Ragland. We yeah. got we got Jaron Reed. And we had who was the other one? Oh gosh, I've now oh uh who was it? Well, Chris Jones, obviously. <laughs> mm-hmm. And oh gosh, who? Oh, was you're saying one? from the second round. Yeah. Yeah, Emmanuel Ogba with the Browns. Emmanuel, thank you. Emmanuel Ogba. That was the fourth yeah. one. Yes. Yes. So four players in that second round have been Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> so that's that's a very yeah. unique draft overall, simply yeah. for that alone. And 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 a few that I mean still could be Kansas City Chiefs one day down the road. You never know, man. You never Tyler know. Boyd's a free agent, right? Well, you so, never know. Never know. Um, I, getting just wrapping up then concluding of talking about this year's class though. Yeah, any, yeah, yeah. sorry. Any, anybody on day three that really stands out to you that would be a good fit for the Chiefs? There's there's a couple guys I'll name them off. Um, like Marcus Harris from Auburn. I I like the strength that he has. Um, I I think, I mean he he can bench press. He can essentially bench press the the guard back to the quarterback, and I watched him do it. Um, he he had the, he had that level of strength. He's <clears throat> the weird thing is he can't duplicate that type of strength laterally. So like if he's having if they're trying to do a reach block, he he's just not able to do it from uh, from an angle. It's got to be you know with the with the shoulders or the shoulders and chest square, be able to do that. So that's something that'll be interesting in terms of working on. But he's got the quickness. Lateral quickness and acceleration to make it work, even though it's not necessarily top end. Um, Kai Wingo from LSU is a guy that I I think he's got unexpected athletic ability when you see his size initially, and you're like, oh, okay. So I thought he had good acceleration, lateral quickness again. Uh, I think he'd be, I think he'd pro- provide some sneaky pass rush for his size. Um, I thought he had good strength when he fires off and he's able to square up with a guard. Um, he can knock a defender back, and when he gets into a rhythm, pass rushing wise, he's really tough to stop. But he can he can actually become pretty dominant. But he does struggle against double teams, and that'll be a knock on him. Um, next guy's on the list, obviously Tyler Davis from Clemson. I liked his bull rush, uh, his athletic ability with the ball carrier that he fired off well. Um, he can hold his ground against double teams, and he can in chasing the ball carrier laterally. He's a little undersized for a one tech. And he's gonna need a bump and the bump up athletically to be a three tech on a regular basis. So he's kind of in that no man's land. But there's traits there that I could see Colin wanting to work with. Mason Smith from LSU, uh, long arms. Long arms is the number one thing you see about him, and that's what really helped him as a pass rusher. Um, he's able to bull rush, walk guards back a couple steps. He also is able to use swims and rip moves to disengage from blockers. He has some pretty unexpected burst for his size. He's going to have to work on being able to kind of get a little bit lower and get a little bit better in his upper body strength to really kind of jolt guys and be a strong rotational three tech. I liked his lateral quickness for the Spagnuolo scheme. He just, he needs more power to, to be able to work with. And I think if he gets that, he'll, he'll, uh, he's got a ton of promise. I got two guys left and then I'll be good. Um, Justin, a a boy a boy B, I believe it's a a boy B from Alabama. I apologize, um, but just the G is silent if I remember correctly on that one. So, it's, so. yeah, um, but he's got really good size from Alabama, and he's another one of those guys 
that could be a three, could work in a five. It, if you're wanting a more contain on the five tech on that rush, I think he could do that right now. Um, but he's yeah, he could he could play a three. He could be a three tech kick to end. He's got, I mean, he's got he's got good push. He's got a solid bull rush. He's got a good rip move. But what makes him interesting is the patience he has with his rushes. He doesn't come in a hundred miles an hour like he's trying to, you know, you know, like he's a NASCAR. He's not trying to get to the quarterback the quickest. He's willing to get there at a certain pace and he adjusts based on where the quarterback's at. So he comes in at a steady pace, which allows him to adjust quicker. And I think that's why it paid off for him and he's able to get some of the sacks he did because he came in under control. But you need some of those people, like, you know, you need a balance of people that can come in under control, can potentially contain, and then you have the NASCAR person that forces them around. So that's where you got to have that blend collectively in your rush. And people people like Aboyabi are the ones that kind of help you in a contain style against more athletic quarterbacks. And... Like when he gets close to a quarterback, man, he finds that angle and then he he finds that other gear. He's not that stick shift that gets stuck, like we were talking about earlier. It's like, nope, he finds that third gear and boom, he gets there. Once he sees a quarterback, he picks up, business picks up for him and he doesn't mess around. Then the final guy I'm going to mention, um, Christian Boyd from Northern Iowa. Really, really big fan. And if I remember correctly, he's from Blue Springs, Missouri. So he's a, he's a local guy from the area. Um, here's what, here's the first thing I got in my notes. Christian Boyd didn't play around. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, he's here to collapse the pocket and push defenders back. And he's all out of, uh, all out of gum or whatever the phrase is, you know, <laughs> like he's, he's here to do three things and he's all out of gum. Um, he has, he's got a great burst out of his stance. He can knock a guard or center back with ease, just incredibly strong. Like that's the thing that stuck out to me. It's just how strong he was. And, um, like, he holds the line against double teams. It looks like you, he's got two grown players that have ideally at least 600 pounds of strength between them. And he's able to hold the line against them. And he's like, what are you doing? That's ticklish. Stop. <laughs> no, um, no. Um, but, um, but seriously, like he, I mean, he can split double teams. He's got counter moves to split them. So I enjoyed that fact to him. He can bull rush, swim, rip. He's got a quality spin move for a size that he shouldn't have, but he does. And he doesn't stand still for long. There's some defensive linemen. They're like, okay, I'm going to hang here. Yeah, no, I beat the, I didn't beat the defender. I'm just going to kind of hang here. Boyd's trying to figure out a way to get to the quarterback or get to the ball carrier. He's not, he's not here just to do a, you know, do a site survey. No, he's, he's here to be able to kind of go chase the football. And um, he's always trying to defeat the block, even if he, even if he doesn't. So he's got that relentless mentality, that championship mentality that you need. And, um, he he's he's good on backside pursuit like he shouldn't be at his size to be that good at backside pursuit but he is he hustles his rear off and pursuit angles to make a play and boyd is a guy that i think is going to be that fourth fifth round range i'm hoping he gets to the fourth and if he does like he would be a really really good one tech and he gives the chiefs the kind of pop they need at one tech and the athletic ability that they need at one tech too so he's a guy that I'm selfishly going to be hoping a lot. I'm hoping he's still there on day three, and I'm hoping the Chiefs can kind of uh, draft him pretty quickly. And 38 reps on the bench press at his pro day. Oh, I'm not surprised with what I saw on tape. <laughs> that um, is ridiculous. Um, yeah, the the strength that he's got to have and the, the durability. I mean, and like you said, I mean, really good size as far as, but you know, so yeah, thirty eight reps on the on the bench is elite. Yeah. So there's certainly the athleticism there. Good coaching, which you would get from Joe Cole, and would be interesting to see what you could turn him into. I mean, Nick, this seems like to me a draft where it, it, you're taking a tackle in the between the first and probably third rounds. You're probably taking a crapshoot that i mean i've seen i've seen guys listed in some of these pre-draft rankings in first round and then another one you'll see them in the fourth mm -hmm. you know that there's just that much divergence on this group because there's not really a standout player i mean it's it's not after like the, it's, yeah after murphy it, it gets tough and even you know, murphy can be the site i mean the, he he and, and newton it seems like are consensus around the top players but then you know everything after that really just as a crapshoot but 
there might be some value in the day three that you're going to get some guys that just kind of slip through and are going to be better than maybe their expectations are. Yeah, and, and I think after, just for me personally, and how the Chiefs run their scheme, after after Murphy, it's really more what what do you need role player wise, or what do you need long term wise? Do you need a do you need a three? Then that's Chris Jenkins on like a day you know a day two, second round ideally, or do you need um, a one tech you know, or do you need a guy who could rotate between a three and a five, or what? Like each guy, I felt like after 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 Murphy in terms of what the Chiefs are going to need on their scheme. They're all a bunch of role playing tackles. Like I, I think last year's defensive tackle class was more defined than what this one is, and I think you're, and that's why you're going to get value because there's no, there's not a lot of guys that just just jump out and you're like, hey, we got to have this guy because he's the dominant three tech, athletic, has checks all the boxes. It's just there's certain things that each guy's got skill set wise, and then it's just a, it's kind of in the this defensive tackle class is in, in my opinion in the eye of the beholder. Well, it'll be interesting to see where the Chiefs go and if it is something that, you know, uh, particularly on day three to me might be a position that they circle. Mm -hmm. Um, For this season, certainly looking for depth, but you can see them absolutely looking at the future as far as needing a a true player that can line up in the middle, a a space eater for the long term, Mm -hmm. Um, and just some depth for now. I mean, they have addressed defensive line depth, and that's kind of one of the things we're going to be talking about next is uh, the trio of players the Chiefs either kept or added this week and uh, yeah. Mike Dan is, the, is a big one. Um, three year, $24 million deal, essentially two years, 6.5, which uh, to me was kind of in the middle. I mean, I thought I thought Dana would get an eight year, $8 million a year deal. I think that's what he was, he was kind of looking for. Mm-hmm. It started to seem like maybe because the market fell, maybe he might end up at like the 5 million level. So, I mean, she's for two for two for 6.5, essentially, with you know the option to make it a three years, 24. I think it's a good deal for the Chiefs and for Dana. Yeah, it's it's good for both parties. Because Dana gets the payday that he was looking for, and they Chiefs know what he can bring to the table. They've developed him all the way through, and he show he had one of his better years statistically. But I mean, on the field, he you know he's reliable. They know what they get with him. They they can plug and play him in various spots based on the down and distance, and like that's and. That's very valuable, more so than people realize, and it allows them to have somebody in front of Felix Ndiki Uzama if he isn't up to where they want in terms of being able to defend the run. So if he if Felix isn't at, up to that point where they need him to be, they have somebody who can start on those downs and do that for them. We're not saying he can or can't. We just don't know until the pads come on in August to be able to determine that and see that in preseason games as well. So. Like that gives the Chiefs some assurance, you know, and some insurance and assurances. Um, but it gives them some uh, insurance for that that part of Felix's game that he's still developing. Well, it's, and it certainly means that hey, Carloftis and Dana can be your starters with Felix being the rotational guy at number three. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, we'll see when and if Aminahu gets on the field, but you, we're certainly not expecting him for Week One coming back right. from that ACL. So yeah, I mean a. To me, you're signing Mike Dana to be a starter, and then it's just a matter of you know how much you know Felix can fit in and, and work his way in. I'm expecting him to play a much bigger role this year, and I think they need to because you know Dana had a really good first half of the season. I think he kind of wore down a little bit in the second half from usage. Now we'll see if maybe last year helped him. Maybe that will help with the stamina. But you know, to me, Mike, especially with the way he plays, because he's not just a stand around the defensive line and poke people. I mean, he gets downfield. I mean, he he's he's one of those high motor guys, Nick, mm-hmm. and that kind of running around wears on you. So I can see why maybe his production slipped in the second half of the season. Um, you you limit his snaps, maybe you can keep him fresher throughout the season. Yeah. No, I mean, that's... Yeah. that, that I'm, I'm glad he's back here. He's a good rotational part of their defensive line. And him and Chris are kind of the leaders of that defensive line room, along with Pinnell. Uh, did she bring back another player? In Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, that I honestly Nick did not think that Clyde was going to be back. 
Um, you know, he he seemed at times last year like a guy who uh, would would em- embrace a change of scenery. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it's been a tough spot for him being the first round pick that didn't live up to the expectations that everyone had. Um, had a lot of bad luck with injuries and illnesses that obviously are not within your control. Um, but one thing that was always stood out to me and been consistent to me about Clyde, Nick, is that his reputation inside that building and inside that locker room has always been a 180 from his reputation with Chiefs fans. As For as much criticism as there's been from Chiefs fans, there has been none from the Chiefs. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've, they've appreciated how hard he's worked. They've appreciated that he's gritted through some tough injuries and some illnesses and stayed there with a positive attitude. Um, I mean, there's not, I've never heard a bad word about Clyde from anybody in that organization. And I, I think coming back to, to me, Nick, I think it shows a sign of maturity from Clyde because I think that it would have been really easy, you know, to, you know, to leave, to just say, Hey, you know, I need a change of scenery. doesn't matter what the money is. Just get me someplace fresh where I can compete for a starting job. And I'm, I'm out of here. But I think Clyde gets it. Clyde knows that this is a good fit for him, that, hey, it's a running back spot, so you're always one injury away from being able to be a starter again. And I always believe, you know, for any player, you're better off staying in a system that you know that you're comfortable with because going somewhere else, there's a huge learning curve. And it doesn't always mean it's going to work out. Look what happened with Cole in, in New York doesn't always work out the way you want it to. Whereas Clyde knows the coaches here. He knows the system. He knows if anything happens to Isaiah Pacheco, he's got a reasonable chance to be the number one guy in this town again. So to me, I, I I think it's a sign of maturity for him to come back and stay in Kansas City. And obviously the Chiefs are happy to have him back at that cost. Yeah, and to, and to be the counterpoint on that, part of me kind of wonders if he was looking for that change of scenery and the opportunity never never came that yeah, he liked. it could have been. And so that's why he's back in Kansas City on the one year. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I mean, for me personally, it doesn't necessarily move the needle in terms of I, I would still be looking for a running back in the draft or I'd be potentially signing another person to fill that Jarek McKinnon role because they still need that. Um, with Clyde, you know what you're getting. You know what he's capable of. And right now, the best thing he's capable of is catching on the backfield and kind of working in space on screens. Um I mean, slow and in, in, in the run part, there wasn't enough burst there, you know, and, but I mean, he's good in pass protection. So, I mean, like he's got his pluses and minuses. The chiefs know how to utilize them. The chiefs know what to expect from him. They know what they're going to get from him overall, but they still need more explosiveness because between him and Pacheco, there, there's just not enough there um, to be able, I know people say, Oh, Pacheco runs a, a 40 at this thing. Yeah. There's not many times you're going to be, running in pure straight line. So the ability to stop start and that type of stuff or be able to change direction and maintain speed, like that's what I'm referencing. When I talk about the Chiefs need something a little bit different in the running back room to pair with what they've already got. So, yeah, I mean, look, he's back. It is what it is. Um, Yeah. (laughs) You know, like I'm I'm not upset about it, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, but you still need other pieces for that running back room to take a new step and to evolve and you haven't gotten there yet, but I'm not upset about it because I know it's April. So they still have till September to get that figured out. Yeah. I mean, it's, they're still lacking to me a third down back. They're still lacking a, a reliable pass catcher out of the backfield guy. Um, to me, yeah, Clyde is, he's he's, he's several so backup that if Pacheco goes down and you need somebody that can, you know, do a little bit of everything, Clyde's your guy. I mean, and after that, you know, they got a lot of depth pieces. Keontae Ingram, LaMichael P. Ryan, and Eric Prince. I mean, those are, that's depth to me. It's not necessarily anybody that you're pointing to and saying, this is going to be our starter for six weeks because Pacheco is down. So I'm with you. I mean, they can still use some depth. And I think that I, I will see what, you know, Brett Veach says. I mean, he called a shot when he said that there's a seventh round back in the, in the draft that will be a thousand yard guy. And, Pacheco certainly looks like he's going to be a thousand yard guy eventually. Yeah. Um, but you know, it'd be interesting to see if he thinks the same thing. Cause I think there's, there's a lot of people who say that there's going to be some seventh round and undrafted running backs that are pretty good this year. Mm-hmm. So um, the last piece that the chiefs brought back, we talked about the top of the show, have a backup quarterback. Now Carson Wentz in the house, Nick. Yeah. I mean, with Carson, look, I mean, he's got the athletic ability that Alex Smith had very similar to him. 
Um, very similar style as what Alex Smith was. I think that's what was appealing for Doug Peterson when they drafted him in Philly. Obviously, he had two other stops, or technically three other spot stops with the Colts and then the Commanders and the Rams. So, but I mean, he's he's in a scheme that's going to take advantage of what he can do athletically. His passing style with Gabbert. Gabbert was high on a lot of throws, and I just don't think Gabbert really got comfortable in the system. And also, Gabbert, in my opinion, was kind of able to help Mahomes evolve in the fact that, like, Gabbert had been around Tom Brady for a couple years, so he got to learn, Mahomes got to learn some of the nuances from maybe Brady and the way Brady approached things that he's able to pick from Gabbert to be able to help his game. So there may be parts of Patrick Mahomes' game that we don't even realize were enhanced by what they invested in playing Gabbert. So now with Carson Wentz, you kind of we'll see how everything shakes out. But this honestly might be one of the better backups that the Chiefs have had in terms of potential. And if Patrick Mahomes, you hope it didn't happen, but if Patrick Mahomes has to sit out for a little bit, like Wentz actually can be the reason you win some games, not just struggle to get by. Yeah, and you know, and I asked uh, Carson about you know coming into Kansas City after playing with with Doug Peterson for five years, um, and you know, and he says, "Hey, picking up the X's and O's will be a little bit of it," but he says, from you know watching the Chiefs offense, he just sees the similarities, and mm. obviously, you know, feels very comfortable. He says it, it says it hits like home. So he should be much more comfortable, I think, than Gabbert was in the offense. And, you know, and and it was alluded to during the press conference with Carson, and he didn't want to talk about it. But uh, sure seems like Carson Wentz was plan A for the Chiefs last year, and, and Blaine Gabbert was plan B. So now they've got plan A. They've got Carson Wentz as their backup, and it does seem like a good fit. I mean, and once again, what do the Chiefs want in a backup quarterback right now? Um, you know, it used to be that Andy Reid wanted, you know, a, a quarterback to develop, and then they still sometimes have one in the third spot right now. Chris Oladokun is kind of their guy, but when you've got Patrick Mahomes as your quarterback, you want somebody that can win you some games in the event that you had to play without him for uh, four to six weeks. Mm-hmm. And in Carson Wentz, they got their guy. You know, the Chiefs yeah. are not the Indianapolis Colts. They they practice effed. <laughs> That's a, the ant- antithesis of what uh, a Colts coach once said about when they're playing without Pey- Peyton Manning. Yeah. Um, Chiefs plan on winning football games if they had to play without Mahomes, and Carson Wentz, I think, can help them do that. Yeah, no, I don't disagree that he athletically, like I said, well, he can take off scrambling if he needs to. That element of the offense and and the experience that he has, having to be the guy, having to prep as the guy, and all that type of stuff like that. And he's he's been around the league enough and had to experience other franchises and organization. He'll understand how good he has it in Kansas City and just how much a coaching staff can do to help him with his career and get it back to a point where he maybe becomes a viable option for a team wanting a starting quarterback again. I can't. I mean, how can not playing for the commanders? Um, pretty Eric Bieniemy. Back in, I think that was 22 he was there. I mean, how could how could a year like that not just make you grateful for any other position? I don't know. Um, that Hey, plan A for the backup quarterback spot seems to work out for the Chiefs. Mm-hmm. Um, they will be going on to plan B about where they're going to be playing in 2031 and beyond, Nick. Um, plan A went down in flames on Tuesday night. Um, kind of a resounding rejection by voters of the plan to build a new stadium for the Royals downtown and to build a reimagined arrowhead out of the Jackson County Sports Complex. Um, we were on Tuesday night live following the results, but now that uh, the election is officially over in the rearview mirror, um, what's your takeaway from the results and where the Chiefs go next? Yeah, um, I mean, part of it is I'm going to do this a handful of ways about why I think it why I think it failed. This isn't a guarantee, but this is why I think it failed. There was a lot in terms of like when the Royals rolled out their plan, they needed to have decisively what they wanted to do, what it was going to have a breakdown of cost, estimation cost, how they were going to approach either construction or what they were going to do here and there. Um, and have it all detailed out or how or funding where the what the funding was going to be used for specifically in certain ways and but have it all broken down to where people can analyze it people can go through it all people can go through every every thing as if they're on their own accountant type of thing and the stadium design itself 
didn't it, it missed the heart of what um of what made Kaufman special for a lot of people that enjoy it and that is not having the fountains and not having the crown for the scoreboard those are two things that down the road here no matter where the royals end up thinking they want to go or what they're going to do if it stays in the region of kansas city or kansas or missouri in this aspect here that stadium is going to need to have those things for can for fans of the kansas city royals to get behind it because the one that the plan that they had just was far too Far too plain. It took away what made Kauffman Stadium special and what fans loved about it and what made it unique from other ballparks and in all of MLB. So that aspect of those are, are things that they're gonna have to I think they need to go back to the drawing board on that on that part first. And I think they'll be surprised that people will be a little bit more behind it as long as the stadium looks the way that they remember Kauffman looking. In some regards, now, what I don't know from an aspect perspective is, is there certain things from a construction perspective or from a compliance perspective that maybe doesn't allow that to happen? You know, I don't know that aspect of that. So like, that would be that would be a question that, like, you, if, if you can't do those things, then explain those out in that way, that this is why you have to do it this and this way. There's just there's far too much stuff that was left a mystery and left a guess. And if you're wanting to get people to approve a tax of that nature, you've got to be able to be accountable for what all their money is going towards and why it's going towards it this way versus another way. And then on top of that, with what's going on property tax wise for people outside there, what's going on property tax wise in Jackson County that was always going to be a tough hill to climb because of how much, you know, property tax went up on a lot of people's homes in that area and stories we've done in KSHB 41 about it. Like people, some people I think saw this as their way to say, all right, we've been taxed enough in Jackson County. We've kind of had this happen too much recently. And, you know, some people are like, Hey, I'm just trying to be able to, pay the property tax that just jumped up on me significantly. And for people that don't know, I know there's some stories where it jumped up 76% on some people. And one that's a pretty steep jump um, for people that are trying to stay in their house. So, I mean, I know that happened in one, um, in one story we did. Um, but when you look at everything collectively, like I think that had a lot to do with that. And I think people, trying, like I said, trying to be able to survive with groceries and everything else that they're having to try to afford in the, in, in overall in the economy right now. I just think people felt that that vote, if you're not going to have everything explained in the way that is satisfactory to them, they didn't feel comfortable losing even more money from their bank account than what they already did. And people can say, well, it's a continuation of the tax. Yeah. But if they're not getting relief in other spots that they used to, they don't see it mindset wise in that same way in terms of continuation. Matt, if you can give some thoughts, go ahead and then, and I don't want to take up all that time. And then I'll give some chief's thoughts after that about the arrowhead. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, the la when the, when the remodeling of these two stadiums was passed in 2006, you know, remember it narrowly passed. I mean, 53, 47, the rolling roof was on that ballot as well. And it went down to defeat and, you know, there were there were some who, after the fact, you know, kind of spun it as saying, hey, the, the rolling roof was on there mostly so that people felt better about voting for the renovations and they gave them a chance to vote no against the rolling roof. And therefore, maybe they were able to get it across the finish line by having those two issues separate. And so people could vote yes and no, say, no, we won't want to spend our money on the roof. But, yeah, we'll, we'll put money into these stadiums. Um, but I'm with you. I mean, one, there's a, there's a, I think there's a lot of confluence of things that, that combined here. The, the tax issues in Jackson County were a huge part of it. Um, the, honestly, the lack of vision in these plans was a huge part of it. Um, the issue popping up the week before the election of the complaints about Oak Street being completely and totally blocked off and the Royals, honestly, you know, John Sherman's half-hearted you know we'll change the plan it's no big deal i mean as i i saw one person on twitter you know noted it and i thought it was hilarious and said about the only way you can change that plan to fix it is the you know build 
uh, shoe, uh, you know, uh, the Horseshoe Stadium, the old polo grounds on the on the Kansas City Star site to make it fit. I mean, the site selection process. I mean, everything that went about it from the Royals standpoint, because the Royals was the most important part of it. Let's face it. That was the biggest part of the money where everything was going to go. And it was not an exciting plan. It was there was there were expectations all along. This was not the site that everybody thought that was going to be selected. There was neighborhood opposition because the crossroads and, and this stadium does not seem to be a good fit. Um, and then when you bring in the Chiefs part of it, I understand why the Chiefs vi stadium vision wasn't that great because I mean, they wouldn't be moving, they wouldn't be per turning dirt on this until maybe 2028. I mean, if, if if this had passed, obviously, the new stadium would be built downtown, you'd knock down Kaufman, and then the Chiefs would start working on their place. Uh, it just didn't make any, you know, to a degree, it doesn't make any sense. And, you know, separating these two entities, these two clubs, is probably the right thing. The day and age of one county in this city, especially this metro Kansas City is not the biggest. You know what? We're not, well, I was going to say Oakland and San Francisco, but Oakland doesn't even have sports teams anymore. Um, we're, we're not Houston. We're not, you know, New York. We're not these big markets that, you know, maybe one end of your one city can handle it. And even in those markets, a lot of the teams are in different counties, different cities. So I don't think it's a problem to separate these two teams. I think that the Royals have a huge problem in that there's a disconnect between where their fans want them to play and where the team wants to play. And I think one huge problem is that obviously we know downtown baseball is economically works. That's where most new stadiums are being built or in downtowns. That's where it's the, the economics seem to make sense. But Chiefs fans, or excuse me, Royals fans, do not seem to appreciate downtown baseball. I mean, and maybe it's because they like the Kauf Kauffman so much. Maybe if a new stadium design looked like Kauffman, they would embrace it more. I don't know, but that's a problem. And and the Chiefs, honestly, I mean, they need the Royals to figure out what they're going to do before they can figure out what they're going to do. Unless the, Chief, the, the Chiefs are just going to move somewhere else in the Metro, which is entirely possible. Um, but then again... I mean, you have to you have to deal with it now, even though these two teams, nobody's going anywhere until 2031. They've got leases, so they're not going anywhere. And I don't think that either team will or wants to move, but they got to come up with something better than this, Nick. Yeah, and, and I'll <clears throat> I'll touch on the Chiefs perspective, um, like you said, perfectly like they they need the Royals to figure out their situation so they can figure out theirs. Um, that, that's a big key part of that. And I, I think going forward, I think both of them are going to have to be separate in what they, in what they do. Um, Cause I mean, if the chiefs are on their own, I think fans will voters and would be more receptive to whatever the chiefs potentially want to do on their own and what their own accord would be. Um, and for, for the reimagined arrowhead and everything just the way that the the plan didn't really have you know it had updated scoreboard you know the video board the ribbon board the video board the the fan walkway and all that stuff it, yes it had all that but there wasn't a lot of new bells and whistles um overall so then the question i personally have is what since i don't i'm not an expert on building codes and like you know construction and things of that nature was there certain things that they can't really adjust on the stadium that would cause problems or something that would cause if they if they mess with this part of the structure, does that mean that they have to, you know, is there other parts that have to come up to code with the way, you know, buildings are done now versus when they were done when Arrowhead was made from some things that may potentially be grandfathered in? Um, so, like, that... That part of that part of that kind of makes me wonder if that's why maybe there's not going to be a roof on something because cost wise, if you do this, this, and this with the roof, then you know, then uh, that changes this, this, and this code wise that you got to fix, and then that jumps up that cost to where I I wouldn't stun me if they showcased everything in a presentation or if they showed numbers that that it would be cheaper to build a brand new stadium 
that would be compliant to all building codes, probably all ADA codes, everything imaginable, than it would be to kind of continually try to renovate Arrowhead Stadium. And and the kicker of it is, like, I think I think in the bigger picture for for Chiefs fans and kind of people of Kansas City in general, I think they want something that's going to bring some big events here. They've had the NFL draft here. The, you know, the Final Four hasn't been here since Kemper in like what late, late eighties at, at best, maybe early nineties. Um, and I think people want some big events here. I think people want some big concerts here. Like just last night when I was, you know, watching Philadelphia host WrestleMania. If you put a put a roof on uh, on on like a new Arrowhead Stadium or you know that type of thing, maybe you get WrestleMania here, and that would be big for a two day event in the hall of in the hall of fame that they have typically done in the past, that could be a big moment for the Kansas city market. You know, that puts them in, in that potential play with, you know, not having to predict the weather in that, in that part. So I just, I think people are hoping that if there is whatever they elect to do with Arrowhead stadium, that it's something that benefits common fans, the, and that it's something that can allow big events to come, to Kansas City. Uh, I know uh, we've already gone over time, Nick, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to mention two elephants in the room. One yeah, very un, very unpopular take, and one reality. The unpopular take is that the even though I like I mentioned, you know, downtown baseball works. It's it is an economic driver. It's been successful in a lot of places. I think that even the ads that the campaign was running, 17 of the last 18 major league stadiums have been built in downtowns. But you've mentioned the key, which is that if the if the Chiefs are going to build a new Arrowhead Stadium, it's got to have a roof so that you can have your long events. And honestly, so you don't have things that happen like, you know, in, in the playoff game, the divisional round when, or the, the wildcard game, rather, when you've got people, people had frostbite that had their fingers amputated, Nick. I mean, that was a life-threatening condition and playing in that game for potentially the players, but absolutely for the fans. And I get it. I mean, I, if they have a roof, I want it to be retractable so that they can play on some crummy days. I mean, I'm I'm okay with that. Have the roof closed, you know, open for as many football games as you can. I don't care if it's snowing. Have the roof open if it's 26 and snowing. It doesn't need to be open if it's minus 4 degrees. And it doesn't need to be open if it's 105 degrees and Taylor Swift is doing a residency. I mean, those are shows that you can get. And But here's the reality is that you look at the stadiums that are being built and with domes. State Farm in Phoenix is about the only one I can think of of late that hasn't been built with something else with it. You know, most, uh, most dome stadiums, honestly, guess where they are, Nick? They're downtowns. Because if you're going to have a dome stadium, you know, to make it economical for a city or for a county or whomever it is, it needs to be next to a convention center because that's where you get the most events and that's where you get the people and the money in. You know, building a state, Phoenix can do build State Farm out in the suburbs because it's Phoenix. It, it got, you know, 8 million people that live there. So they know they're going to be in a Final Four rotation. They know they're going to be in the Super Bowl rotation. They know they're going to get every single concert that comes through. They know all of that. If the Chiefs, you know, were to build a dome stadium in Wyandotte County, are they going to get a you know Final Four every five years? No. I mean, it might be one every 20. Are they going to get a Super Bowl every five years? No. It might be once in the stadium's history. I mean, just because nobody wants to have a Super Bowl in Kansas City in the cold. I mean, Indianapolis has a dome stadium, and I think they've had one Super Bowl. Minneapolis used to, has been in the rotation. They don't want to go back there ever again. Um, I mean, you know, it's just they don't want to have any cold weather locations. So you're looking at maybe, you know, in the stadium's lifetime, maybe a couple of Final Fours, maybe a Super Bowl. That's about it. Um, a lot of concerts, sure. But are you going to get every concert to come through Kansas City? No, because there's not enough population necessarily for every concert to want to stop here. They're going to want to stop in bigger markets. So that's that's the one that's my unpopular take that from an economic standpoint, if you're going to build a dome stadium in Kansas city for a football team, it probably needs to be downtown or it needs to be next to Bartle hall, um, which is not really easy to do, but, or you build a new convention center, which is also on the table for some people because Bartle hall is aged and is obviously falling behind, you know, competing with other markets. Okay. I'm done with that one. My other quick take, 
<laughs> on the reality though, Nick, is that, you know, and this compares to me like the Kansas City Airport, because when Kansas, the K, original KCI that we all know and love was built in the 70s, it was designed to be the state of the art airport. And what happened was, is they built KCI to make it as easy as possible to get in and out, just to go through security, because sec, there was no security back then. And then all of the hijackers of the 1970s completely changed everything and change security. And KCI was never the same again. I mean, it was it was no longer economical the way they designed it to be because of the security that they had to have. So it never worked. I mean, we all loved it, but it was never worked as it was designed because of just changing market conditions. The changing market conditions right now is that every stadium built going forward is absolutely going to have gaming as part of it and gambling and sports books. And right now, you would be insane to me to build a stadium in Missouri until you know that you can incorporate gaming, incorporate sports books, and get that money into it. So until Missouri incorporates that, I am absolutely assuming that one or both of these teams is going to look hard at Kansas because there is too much money leaving on the table to not do that. And the only thing I'll use to close this out um, on my aspect of it is the only thing that I, I, I would say for both teams is treat the voters like they're investors in what you're trying to do. And if you take that approach and you take that respect with the public to where, like, everything you're talking about to where you bring up, hey, Final Four Super Bowls, this is how many you'd get in the likelihood. This is why this isn't happening, Ruffles. And you go through and you talk through why something may not be happening or why something is happening to it, you're treating each voter like they're an investor. And you're letting them kind of get to see behind the curtain of why the decision was made in the way that it was. So I think that would go a long way in because in this area, in this town of people feeling comfortable with what they're voting for and what they're, quote unquote, putting their money into. Because at the end of the day, if if they approve a tax that they are investing in you they're investing in that franchise they're investing in what you bring to this economy and locally in this area so if you go through it and you talk through it with everybody and you take the time to talk through it and the plan overall and like i said treat them as investors i think they'll be pleasantly surprised with how much more receptive people potentially would be to whatever they vote on down that is that is an absolutely fabulous point because the days of of voters just subsidizing stadiums for teams willy-nilly is completely over. People don't want to do that anymore. You're absolutely right. If people are going to vote for a stadium, they want to return on their investment. If you're going to put $900 million into a bunch of couple of stadiums, then people want to know, is this going to mean that I'm, I'm going to make more money? Does this mean that my neighbor is going to get a job? Does this mean my business is going to have more customers in it? There needs to be an economic impact. And that's what, you know, there was no case made whatsoever about what this project would have done for the community and what it would have done for Jackson County, you know, who right now, you know, feel like that they're not they're getting the raw end of the deal. Um, I, I've, I'm sorry, Nick, I have pontificated long too long on this subject. Uh, thanks for anyone and everyone who stuck around to the very end. Any parting thoughts from that you have, Nick? No, I just close out whenever you're ready. Well, uh, we've got the Chiefs Digest Q&A live coming up on Tuesday night. And then, of course, we will be back on your feeds next week with the next 41 is the mic talking about edge rushers and defensive ends. And I'm really excited about that because I want to know what Nick thinks about a certain guy from Mizzou uh, and the Chiefs. So um, whereas we spent uh, you know all the time talking about Joe Alt on offensive tackles, I want to I want to talk about a guy next week. So uh, with that, we will talk to you again soon. Thanks. Uh, once again, hit, hit the like, hit the subscribe, all those things that you're supposed to do on podcasts and on YouTube. We appreciate you. And until next time, I bid you adieu.